Ah, uh, yes, I should welcome Rocio back to New York City because virtually, because I understand you got your degrees from the New School for Social Research. Um, and uh, you've published, uh, we're, our speaker has published uh, quite a number of very interesting articles, but also two books. Uh, most recently this year, I think, uh, she's the author of Colonial Debts, The Case of Puerto Rico from Duke University Press. And um, previously she published Hegel's Theory of Intelligibility uh, that came out from the University of Chicago Press in 2015. So um, that's amazing that you can write about that. <laughs> it's a very difficult issue, I think. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm really um, delighted uh, to uh, be hosting Rocio this evening. Our procedure as usual will be to have the talk and then to have a Q&A. And we'll be asking you to use the raise hand features because um, there's a bunch of you um, we might miss you otherwise, but except for Virginia, we're going to look out for her real raised hand. Um, and uh, in addition to a large number of articles, Rocio is currently a co-editor with uh, Bonnie Mann, Erin McKenna, and Kamisha Russell of Hypatia Journal of Feminist Philosophy. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to host this talk. Um, and um, the um, I guess um, I can give you the title, which is Dystopian Present, Life in Common, Past Futures, Contesting Fan Fantasies of Collapse. And before I turn it over to Rocio, just have Patricia uh, Cipolliti say a few words. She's our senior fellow at the uh, Center for Global Ethics and Politics. And I want to welcome also our other fellows, as well as our wide, fantastic audience this evening. Patricia. Thank you. Um, I don't really have much to add to that wonderful introduction other than um, I'm very excited that Professor Zambrano agreed to talk to us um, and her um, topic sounds really fascinating. So I'm glad that she's here and glad that all of you are here to have a really awesome conversation. Um, thank you so much everyone for being here. Okay, so Rocio, please take it over. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you all um, so much, especially Carol and Patricia for um, the invitation and, um, and for all the work that has uh, gone into um, organizing and, um, and, uh, and uh, getting, getting the word out that um, this, this event was, was happening. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so the talk that I'm going to share today is... Um, I've been, I've been returning a bit to questions of um, a philosophy of history, conceptions of history, um, and in particular in relation to um, the work on, on uh, decolonial feminism and decolonial thought, um, and, in part and also uh, Black critical thought and Afro-pessimism um, that is um, uh, a, in, framed a lot of the main arguments of the book on Puerto Rico, but I wanted to take some time and space to kind of explore some of those arguments a little bit further. And in particular, this piece, um, which is a, a, a reading of Juliet Quijepino Samiñoso, a, a Afro-Caribbean decolonial feminist, um, and Cydia Hartman, um, a, a U.S. Uh, 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 Afro-pessimist, a uh, thinker of black critical thought. Um, uh, I wanted to, to explore a bit their, their con conceptions of history um, in particular in relation to uh, the context. And I wrote this in the context of the pandemic and in particular, I'm interested in uh, the forms of capture uh, of kind of a political imagination by um, kind of liberal sensibilities. Um, and so, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna share this piece with you um, that will actually be coming out in both French and English soonish. Okay, I want to start with an epigraph from um, from Rethinking the Apocalypse: An Indigenous Anti-Futurist Manifesto. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, in our past, your future. So. 
In the Future Already Was, a critique of the idea of progress in the sex gendered and queer identitarian liberation narratives in Abdeyala, Duderkis Espinosa writes, and I quote, the future already was because the project that modernity dreamed based on the maximum mastery of technology and nature has already come and it is the present in which we live. That pro the promised future, that which we fought for and in the name of which many endeavors and battles of liberation were undertaken is here and it shows its most terrible and scary face, end quote. The present is modernity's future dreamscape, a future that depend depended on undoing forms of life, forms of re relationality, forms of desire that it relegated to a past. The philosophy of history proper to the Enlightenment, particularly French and German, underlies a timeline that builds wor a world emitting a judgment about what ought to be. Past, present, future, a timeline that advances in a double sense. It rushes forward, moving ahead from that which is thereby discarded as that which as that, uh, sorry, as what must be surpassed, left behind, located in the past. That advance is an unbinding, establishing counter memory as an exercise of staying, as a possibility of recovering oneself in a possible past future. In Lose Your Mother, C.J. Hartman writes, and I quote, if slavery persists as an issue in the political life of Black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of a too long memory, but because Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus in a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery, skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment." End quote. The afterlife of slavery indicates that the present is the past of the originary violence of the modern capitalist world. The capture, trade, and enslavement of African people, the genocide, material, and cultural enslavement of, and servitude of indigenous people is the past that survives in the present. Ubiquitous killing and mass incarceration, as well as the continuing dispossession of settler colonialism perpetuate the violence that it originated in the 15th century. The founding violence of the modern capitalist world not only survives, but is actualized today in and by modalities of racial violence. Such ongoing update repeats the unbinding involved in a dispossession not yet completed, necessarily not to be completed if the capitalist enlightened white bourgeois world is to be retained as a center. Hartman clarifies that the afterlife of slavery is the afterlife of property, for example, in Venus and Two Acts, where she describes it as, quote, the detritus of lives with which we yet have to attend, the past that has yet to be done, and the ongoing state of emergency in which Black life remains in peril, end quote. Hartman names a continuation of the originary violence that founded the modern capitalist world by inventing and establishing a racial order as a past that has not been done. The present is the past. We must turn the present into the past in an act of memory that she calls critical fabulation. Such memory requires a fabulation given the radical dispossession that founds modernity and its racial order. Remembering, however, requires attending to Black lives to navigate modalities of that violence today. Attending requires dismantling the world founded by such radical violence, rendering the effectivity of that past, which is the present, inoperative. Attending then is also a form of building from a counter memory. Rethinking the Apocalypse, an indigenous anti futurist manifesto published in March 2020 in the context of the COVID 19 crisis states, in part, and I quote, We live in a future of a past that, it, that is not ours, that is not our own. It is a history of utopian fantasies and apocalyptic idealization. It is a pathogenic global social order of imagined futures built upon genocide, enslavement, ecocide, and total ruination. A world of fetishized endings calculated amidst the collective fiction of virulent specters. From religious tomes to fictionalized scientific entertainment, each imagined timeline constructed so predictably, beginning, middle, and ultimately the end. Inevitably, this uh, narrative, there's a protagonist fighting an enemy other, in parentheses, they write, a generic appropriation of African Haitian spirituality, a zombie, and end parenthesis. And spoiler, spoiler alert, it is not you or me, 
so many are eagerly ready to leave the lone survivors of the zombie, zombie apocalypse, end quote. The present is the future dream by and from capitalist modernity and its racial order. It is the white bourgeois dream that established the other only to destroy it. The indigenous past instituted in the past by modernity's futures updated in imaginary, imaginaries of the apocalypse where only some are saved in the death machine that is the present. The future dream by the ancestors of those who today imagine the end. Those ancestors, ancestors of those who thrive in necropolitical continuity today, imagine bringing the non-modern world to an end, relegating it to the past. The writers of the manifesto indicate that they are not concerned with negotiating the continuity of life with capitalist colonial power, thereby ensuring that the survival of the, they say, dead world that is threatened in its continuous threat to all life. They write, Quote again, apocalyptic idealization is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is the linear world ending from within. Apocalyptic logic exists within a spiritual, mental, and emotional dead zone that also cannibalizes itself. It's the dead risen to consume all life. Our world lives when their world ceases to exist, end quote. The contemporary indeed pandemic fantasy of the end of the world is linked to the fantasy of the end of the non-modern world, an end supposedly completed with the project of advancement, development, progress of modernity. Kind of memory is not an act of recovering something forever lost, silenced, erased. For the authors of the manifesto, it is a way of living that has not ceased. I juxtapose these reflections and coordinates to think the dystopian present without repeating the fantasies of those ancestors who participated in the violence that founded the mo modern capitalist world. The white bourgeois imaginary today actualizes this world and its racial order with a dystopian rather than a utopian fantasy. In his essay, Indigenous Science Fiction for the Anthropocene, Ancestral Dystopias and Fantasies of Climate Change Crisis, Kyle White indicates that allies of indigenous people in the struggle to understand the Anthropocene built from historical categories designed by non-indigenous persons, he says. These categories, white rights, see, serve to keep them at the center. White, quote, speculates that this tendency among allies could possibly be related to their sometimes denying that they are living in times their ancestors would have likely fantasized about, end quote. This is the fantasy of the other that fulfills the material and libidinal needs of capital. Black and indigenous dystopian literary and critical thought is broad and deep. It dislocates the discourse of dystopia, catastrophe, and apocalypse from the white bourgeois gaze that laments the dystopian present because it names the end of the promise of capitalist modernity. That canon, or anti-canon rather, requires much more room for consideration than I have today. Therefore, I want to limit myself to an approximation to dystopian counter-memory in Espinosa and Hartman, exploring the points of contact around their analyses of the present. These points of contact help specify the capture of resistance to and fugitivity from the modern capitalist world and its racial order through fantasies of collapse. They help map the actualization of this racial order through analyses of dystopian and apocalyptic fantasies. Although the present is the future of modernity for Spinoza, and the present is the past of the originary violence that installed capitalist modernity for Hartman, both authors propose coordinates of the dystopian present around the racial order that structures, updates, and perpetuates this world. This order is not limited to the decisions of individuals of power that can be reduced to an individual's race, gender, class, position. Although that too, this order is produced by modern rationality actualized by material, symbolic, and libidinal norms expressed in modernity's fantasies of collapse. So the first section is entitled The Fantasy of Progress, Critique of Modern Eurocentric Feminist Reason. In the future already was, Espinosa provides a decolonial diagnosis of feminist theory of gender and sexuality in Latin America. This theory and praxis is, she says, founded and therefore related to the historical time and the episteme produced by modernity as a projected future, which presents itself as the maximum evolution and development of the human, and therefore as a generalizable project with universalist and imperialist pretensions, end quote. 
although this work focuses on queer thought and praxis, specifically around its production of the abject subject of sexual dissidence that does not depart from the Eurocentric framework of white feminism. It is part of the critique of modern Eurocentric feminist reason that she has developed in several, several texts. In the reason toward a genealogy of experience, Espinosa explains that the imaginary and desire of feminism has been continuous, has and, and continues to be captured by, quote, modernity as the historical temporality that allows us to pursue our freedom, end quote. In her text, she provides a genealogy of feminist thought in Latin America through an exposition of transformations in feminist praxis in which she participated for, in, in which she has participated for decades. She thereby follows a black, uh, black and women of color feminist epistemology that produces knowledge from experience, as she notes. Through this account, she suggests that a universal feminist reason characterized by its commitment to modernity hides the, which, and which hides the coloniality and racism that defines it. The coloniality of feminist reason then refers to, she says, a series of practices and discursive practices in the Foucauldian sense that have been agreed upon and developed by feminists of any tendency and through which they have contributed to the production of a universal subject, woman, women, end quote. And she writes, and I quote again, feminist theorizing has produced and deployed a representation and an image of the woman beyond any difference spatial or temporal as always in a state of subjection with less power and in a hierarchical relation to man also viewed as universal. Taking sexuality as given and contributing in paradigmatic fashion to the production of a technology of gender without questioning the ontological basis of either, feminists have given continuity to the modern myth and its Eurocentric reason, end quote. Before moving on to a consideration of this, uh, of the, her, the characteristics of this uh, modern Eurocentric feminist reason, and in view of the discussion of Hartman's work, it's, brief, it's, it's important to um, briefly recall some of these, what she calls ontological bases. And here, Aníbal Quijano and Maria, Maria Lugones' work are indispensable. So Kihano's concept of the coloniality of power describes the organization of existence initiated by conquest and the colonization of Abab Jayala. The coloniality of power describes the continuous productivity of a system of racial classification that articulates heterogeneous but simultaneous forms of work, sex, gender, subjectivity, and authority. For Kihana, who focuses on the production of the modern capitalist world, raises the central technology and the installation of this world since is it a key access, since it is a key access in the organization of labor. Racial categories are not only produced, but also function to, dis to distribute who is, who is exploitable versus who is fungible, as Hartman puts it, who has access to wage labor and who is subjected to forced labor that depend on modalities of violence that other than exploitation. Race functions as a central technology in the installation in the, of the modern world then, producing a different modalities of violence of the modern capitalist world then, producing different modalities of violence necessary for a well-functioning capitalist system. Lugones affirms the importance of gender, pointing out that race slash gender is a central technology of the modern colonial world. The modern colonial gender system describes how race produces gender. For Lugones, the organization of modern colonial existence was affected through the imposition of the distribution of bodies based on sexual dimorphism. This distribution was made was, was based on racial categories installed and hierarchized within the conquest and colonization through pillage and the organization of labor. The exclusion of women from wage work, relegating women to the sphere of the domestic can be understood as a form of patriarchal domination in the white bourgeois context. Such exclusion posits access to wage work, for instance, as freedom from the mere imposition of the task of reproducing life. In Marxist feminist keys, such exclusion turns women's labor, the tasks of social reproduction, particularly producing workers, invisible. Images of gender equality linked to access to wage work or to interrupting exploitation and the enclosure of women's bodies account for this racial context. Non-white women, specifically Black and Indigenous women, subject to unwaged labor, slavery, servitude, and other forms of violence do not embody the category of woman so constructed. 
However, coloniality is not only a matter of the formation of populations that supply the needs of capital, generating different forms of violence, subjection, and subjectivation. Eurocentrism produces a conception of history, like linearity, maturity, temporality, future, futurity, and universality inscribed in institutions such as the state, the legal order, and the university. Thus, it produces sense itself, installing and mobilizing categories of intelligibility that capture the imagination, the body, memory, and sensation. Along these lines, Spinoza discusses four fundamental issues for modernity and coloniality. I'm, I'm going to focus on two, the Kantian reason and autonomy, and um, kind of a, a, a type of historical progressivism paradigmatically in the Hegelian key. And Spinoza emphasizes that your, the modern Eurocentric feminist reason is developed based on the imaginary of the Enlightenment, particularly German, especially Kantian with its famous imperative, Sapideau, that have the courage to use your own reason. This form of rationality is developed around ideas of objectivity and autonomy, self-legislation, that lead one out of the state of apprenticeship. Spinoza stresses that despite having rejected Cartesian objectivity, feminist reason retains a Kantian imperative to oppose the authority of tradition, submitting everything to the court of reason, which judges with universal principles. It is worth adding that the very idea of emancipation carries the idea of legally freeing oneself from guardianship, key justification with, within conquest, colonization, and independence that posited inhabitants of territories as unable to govern themselves. Espinosa explains that the idea of progress that underlies European enlightenment and that is retained in feminist theory and praxis measures experience with a universalized category, woman. Such a measure guides the advance that, project, that projects of feminist liberation addressed to non-white women purportedly represent. So here the first issue, issue leads to the fourth. The idea of unilinear, unidirectional human, unidirectional human evolution that reaches its maximum state of development in Western European civilization comes not for only from the Kantian uh, autonomy, but also from the philosophy of history developed from Condorcet to Hegel. Not only is the historical violence justified on the basis of the supposed possibilities offered by modernity, but also reason is established as a criterion for the evolution of and towards the human. Such criterion establishes the non-human, the abject, the disposable, that which needs to be saved by being liberated towards the norm of humanity at the center of modern rationality. The point here is that feminist reason is Eurocentric and not considering how this gesture is repeated in its notion of projects for the future. Returning to the future already was then, we can specify how queer thought and praxis replicates the gesture of the liberated subject in being marked as an abject subject because of sexual and sex gender dis dissidence. Getting rid of gender while failing to account for the ontological basis that produces gender, so race, and that makes ex the experience of gender possible universalizes the sexual or gender dissident subject. Characteristics of modern Eurocentric feminist reason that compromise the project of sexual dissidence are, they, are thereby installed. Gender is undone, but in relation to the possibility of liberation guided by the norm of progress and its notion of the human. Sexual and gender dissonance put differently requires liberation to the epistemic, aesthetic, and indeed ontological coordinates of the capitalist colonial modern world. The project of maximum freedom thereby becomes a salvationist liberation project that establishes a historical temporality in which certain relations are relegated to a past that ought to be left behind. To be clear, Espinosa is not arguing against sexual or gender dissonance, which has been part of the um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gender and sexual dissonance movement for, for decades in Latin America. Rather, she is here tracking the capture of such dissonance by the terms of modern Eurocentric reason. In this context, Espinosa introduces the need for, the, for a counter memory, and she writes that if there is struggle to happen around enabling sex, sexual practice, practices and non binary gender, gender subjectivities, here is where you have it not as an unusual or inaugural movement, but as an anti normative exercise of memory. Against the friction of starting all over again, the task um, of abandoning the arrogance is urgent. End quote. 
An anti-normative memory, moreover, is the axis for developing resistance to, she says, assimilation to the narratives hegemonic and counter-hegemonic of gender and sexuality produced by slash from the modern Western matrix, end quote. Rather than seeking liberation to the freedom of sexual dissidence as defined by the modern colonial world, Espinosa seeks to rescue the memory of relationality and resistance that has exercised such dissidence in confrontation with the modern colonial world. This memory, she writes, is an activity of, she says, documenting resistance and epistemic ruptures from other positions of the colonial subject. Key here is abandoning the imperative to leave behind what is posited as behind modernity's project of futurity, that which is posited as traditional or as backward, and as that which does not allow for sexual or gender dis dissonance to begin with. Key here is remembering a resistance, indeed, to dissidence from modernity's future that has always been operative. The future already was then. The consummation of the modern project is not something that is aspired to, but the actuality that has been achieved through colonial capitalist modernity. We are not facing a future to come, but rather exp the experience resisted by racialized communities for centuries. The dystopia of the present is the realization of modernity's promise for the future. The future already was, she, Espinosa tells us, is an expression she heard from Miriam Pixum, who, in defense of the territory against mega mining projects, affirms not pessimism in the face of the broken promises of the modern capitalist world or the modern capitalist project, rather, the success of the dream of, a, of modernity, one that is fundamentally a death machine, as she puts it, one that requires unrelenting unbinding from the memory of life in common. Counter memory, anti normative memory does not look to a future or a past with nostalgia. It returns to life in common, relegated to a past in order to build from its, uh, Spinoza says, porosity to contemporary forms of domination and injustice. End quote. In dialogue with Afrontera on epistemic racism and the Eurocentric capture of social movements, she clarifies that if we are going to think about the future, it would have to be done from dreaming the past, soñar el pasado, dreaming the world that modernity has denied. Social movement, she continues, fight against the order of death in advance, which wants to finish dismantling the communal bond intrinsic to everything that exists. So to say that the future already was is to invite us not to the past, however, but to return to that which is beyond what has been relegated to the past by the modern Eurocentric reason. So fantasies of the commodity, fungibility and critical fabulation. The future already was, but for Sadia Hartman, that means that the present is the past. That has not yet been done. The dystopia of the present is the actualization of the originary violence that continues to organize existence based on a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago, as I quoted um, uh, some time ago. The afterlife of slavery, as I also quoted, is evident in the skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, and incarceration and impoverishment. The afterlife of slavery is also recall the detritus of lives which we have yet to attend, a past that has not been done, and the ongoing state of emergency in which Black life remains in peril. In Scenes of Subjection, Harmon details a continuation of the violence of slavery through the process of emancipation. Exemplary here is debt and its modalities of subjection, which reinstall such violence in the responsibility of the emancipated subject. This uh, subject is supposedly free and therefore responsible for the failures in a system designed to generate and capture value through um, those very failures. The notion of fungibility is key to understanding the modalities of the originary violence updated ongoingly in altered material and historical conditions. In scenes of subjection, Hartman writes that the fungibility of the commodity makes the captive body an abstract, an empty vessel vulnerable to the projection of, of others' feelings, ideas, desires, and values, and as a property, and as property, the dispossessed body enslaved is a surrogate for the master's body, since it guarantees his disembodied universality and acts as a sign of his power and dominion. End quote. 
Fungibility index is the logic of the commodity to which captured, transshipped, trans and enslaved African people were subjected. This experience inaugurates the modern capitalist world. This is a logic beyond the Marxist account of the worker as a sine qua non commodity for the creation of surplus value, purportedly the axis of global economic a global economy based on profit. The captured body is a commodity in a different sense, capital asset and labor power as value and the producer of value, for example. Modalities of violence reproduced ongoingly respond to the disposability of the enslaved and being at minimum counted as part of the uh, cost of production in the plantation. Yet such modalities of violence exceed the productivist paradigm that never, nevertheless reigns supreme in critiques of political economy. And I think in fact, it exceeds as well the, the, the account of originary accumulation or primitive accumulation that is often um, appealed to, to develop this point. And minimum, Hartman points to a libidinal economy of slavery that is key for the production of universality, power domination, and racial terror. The possibility of a projection of, to, of other feel, others' feelings, ideas, desires, and values represents a circuit of value beyond labor, commerce, and economic profit. The crucial point here is that the disposability is retained in the contract in a post-emancipation -emanci world. In the context of emancipation, Hartman explains, rather than being eliminated, the fungibility of the commodity is adapted through the rights of man and the citizen and the wage labor. Hartman rewrites the double freedom that Marx describes in relation to the creation of the worker and the section of the so-called primitive accumulation in capital. The worker is born through a process of enclosure and violent dispossession, according to Marx. Enclosure expropriation for Marx produces a worker free from the means of production, hence free to sell their labor in the market. Exploring the burden individuality of the emancipated person, Harmon points to the duplicity of the newly acquired supposed freedom, being freed from slavery and free of resources, emancipated and subordinated, self-possessed and indebted, equal and inferior, liberated and, um, and encumbered, sovereign and dominated citizen and subject, end quote. The emancipated person is not only responsible for economic success with, within conditions of continued dispossession, but also to a circuit of value beyond economic dispossession. So it's still embedded in a circuit of libidinal economy that makes possible the gratuitous violence of racial terror, which cannot be reduced to economic gain. Harman's point goes beyond economic calculation then. Fungibility is a matter of intrinsically related yet irreducible modes of racial violence. That violence adapts, that is updated um, in altered material condition and legal conditions is one that founds time and again, the space of universality of the white bourgeois order by normalizing gr gratuitous violence. Black fungibility is the central axis in the dystopian present then, since such universality is replenished ongoingly through various modalities of anti-Black violence. The human whiteness is thereby retained as a center. The worker, the woman, constructed at a proximity to whiteness are retained as a center within a past of dispossession that not only survives, but remains at work. This is a ubiquitous phenomenon since it, it is nestled in institutions, regulations, sensitivities, desires bound to the norms of capitalist modernity. Tracking this dynamic of refounding requires tracking variations of racial violence today that fulfill the promise of capitalist modernity and its future. It makes possible tracking the realization of this world, not only to the point of its own destruction, but, it's to, but to its post-apocalyptic desire. Although in different ways than in Espinosa, here again we see that the, the idea of progress and linear historical time of the modern capitalist fantasy is dislocated. Neither the present nor the future are present, presented as progress and promise, but neither as the ap apocalypse and the end to be mourned. Hartman explores the afterlife of slavery in her books and essays as, as parts of Afro-pessimism's contribution. In recent writing, she provides important keys in relation to the speculative doomsday of Du Bois. The comet, she tells us, was written after the 1918 pandemic, after the red summer of 1919, and in the context of colonial expansion. Pessimism needs no justification in that context, she tells us. Her writing thus asks about the possibility of a nurturing a non-hopeful hope. She writes, and I quote, 
The paradox is that human extinction provides the answer and the cor corrective to the modern project of whiteness, which Du Bois defines as the ownership of the earth forever and ever, the possessive claim of the universe itself. The stra strange hold of white supremacy appears so unconquerable, so eternal that it's only certain defeat is the end of the world, the death of man. Neither war nor rights have succeeded in remaking the slave into a human or in eradicating racism. In the wake of disaster, the messenger, the last black man on earth will be permitted to live as human for the first time. I am alive, I am alive, he could shout in the streets of Manhattan without fear of punishment or reprisal. He is alive because the world is dead, end quote. So Fanon writes in The Wretched of the Earth that decolonization, which sets to change the order of the world is a pro program of total disorder. If the dystopian present is the realization of that order, imagining a future beyond the future of modernity requires more than building beyond that order, but rather dismantling it. Most relevant to this, to, to my discussion here, is underscoring the resistance to that very capture of the exposition um, of the dystopian present and po po post-apocalyptic fantasies by the bourgeois capitalist desire. To resist, in other words, the reinstallation of that order in fantasies of collapse. The last black man is alive, she says, because the world is dead, to recall um, Hartman's word, uh, words. In a dystopian present, critical fabulation is an exercise of counter memory. In Venus in Two Acts, Hartman tries to fill the void, the silence in the archive of the middle passage around the captured, transshipped, and enslaved girl. There is no autobiography of a survivor. Crucially, Hartman emphasizes that writing the counter history of slavery is inseparable from writing the history of the present. Hence, critical fabulation is a key method. Fable, she explains, is related to the basic elements of a story and narrative. Fable, therefore, has to do with logical and chronological relationships that are caused and experienced by actors. She writes, and I quote, by playing with and rearranging the basic elements of the story, by representing the sequence of events in divergent stories and from contestant points of view, I have attempted to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened or might have been see said or might have been done. By throwing into crisis what happened when, and by exploiting the transparency of sources as fictions of history, I wanted to make visible the, the production of disposable lives in the Atlantic slave trade and as well in the discipline of history to describe the resistance of the object if only by first imagining it and listen for the mutters and oaths and cries of the commodity. By flattening the levels of narrative discourse and confusing narrator and speakers, by I hope to illuminate the contested character of history narrative event and the fact to topple the hierarchy of discourse and engulf and to engulf authorized speech in the clash of voices. The outcome of this method is a recombinant narrative, which loops the strands of incommensurate accounts and which weaves present, past, and future in retelling the girl's story and in narrating the time of slavery as our present." End quote. Critical fabulation tries to imagine what cannot be verified, she adds. It aims to imagine the experience of violence, both past and present. It conjures that which that which the location between, she says, and I quote again, two zones of death, social and corporeal death names. Critical fabulation guides through that path that has not been done in the black lives that continue to be in peril and that become, she says, visible only in their moment of disappearance, end quote. It is thus a method of dislocating the historical temporal linearity of modernity beyond discourses of progress perpetuated even in supposedly emancipatory projects. Critical fabulation can be seen as a dislocation of the timeline of modernity, the possibility of its future, making visible the continuity of the originary violence of the modern capitalist world and its racial order. It generates a space of accountability about a past that has not been done and a future that has already been. Hartman's notion of critical fabulation resists the capture of dystopia itself by modern Eurocentric reason. This is not an account in a melancholic key lamenting the broken promise of modernity, neither is it an unreflective celebration of the end of the world that is, is the colonial capitalist world. 
This is a sober account of the reality and the realization of the present in a nonlinear or not or progressive continuity with dispossession. Counter memory here is one that recovers the past as a past by turning the past into the past, inviting a dislocation of the present beyond the fantasy of the end of the world that must be lamented. Hartman's text thus confronts us with the task of unbinding this world in all senses, of constructing from other spaces, desires, sensibilities. Counter memory projects, black counter historical projects in her words are, are necessarily, she says, insurgent, disruptive, failed because they require interruption and invite accountability for the present. Hartman writes, the task of writing the impossible, not the fanciful or the utopian, but histories rendered unreal and fantastic, has, the prerequisite of, uh, has as its prerequisite the embrace of likely failure and the readiness to accept the ongoing, unfinished and provisional character of this effort particularly when the arrangements of power occlude the very object that we desire to rescue, end quote. So Espinosa invites us to return home and to build anew from the porosity of spaces that were relegated to the past in every possible way. Hartman invites a return that requires fabulation, emphasizing that this return requires interruption on the reading that I've provided. As I read Hartman, insurgency, disruption, failure are modes of unbinding the dead world of capitalist modernity, thereby recovering the memory of relation unbound by the non-relation of a world built by the middle passage in the plantation. The anti-futurist indigenous manifesto with which I began closes with an addendum that echoes Hartman. They write, in our past, your future. It was the unsystematic, nonlinear attacks on vulnerable critical infrastructures such as gas utilities, transportation corridors, power supplies, communication systems, and more that made settler colonialism an impossibility on these lands. End quote. Hartman and Espinosa's notions of counter memory converge at this point, and they converge with the writers of the manifesto as well. Counter memory recovers the resistance to and fugitivity from the coordinates of the modern capitalist colonial world in all of its senses. Resistance and fugitivity that has always existed. The latter set the coordinates of the past future imagined by counter memory. So, a final, refre uh, final reflection on counter memory. In the dystopian imaginary captured by modern colonial capitalist desire, the end is near and the coordinates of that world are to be negotiated. Decolonial and Afro-pessimist counter memory in the work of Espinosa and Hartman, as I'm suggesting, dislocates this gesture since it updates the fantasy of modernity's future. Counter memory in both thinkers does not install a fantasy of a space time not traversed by the modern world that stands in need of rejection, of dismantling. In affinity with the writers of the manifesto, counter-memory counter builds from porosity and interruption. It rescues and thereby updates resistance, dislocation, detour, which has been, which continues to be axes for their communities. Decolonial and Afro-pessimist counter-memory obeys a temporality and constructs a narrative that is not captured by the fantasies of the collapse of the white bourgeois world. Decolonial and Afro-pessimist counter-memory recovers what has been discarded as what must be surpassed, left behind, locked in the past. In her dialogue with Afrontera, Espinosa says that we might resist such capture, articulating projects centered on caring for, on restoring the communal bond intrinsic to everything that exists. Decolonial and Afro-pessimist counter-memory, one might say, restores a, re a relational order beyond the material and libidinal coordinates of the modern capitalist world. Soñar el pasado, then, interrupt the capture of dystopian thinking in this moment of danger. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, 
I just want to warn whoever has asked for the live transcript that it's pretty funny sometimes they're rendering modernity as maternity, for example. So you should take that live transcript with a grain of salt, whoever has requested it. Um, so now we move to the Q&A and given uh, the substantial number of people, I would like to ask you to use the raise hand function which you can find um, under your participant, um, I think it's, uh, or under, under, it's in several places actually, under reactions um, at the bottom there. So I'm glad to welcome your questions. If I can see you, I could also, I suppose, just if you wave frantically, I could uh, call on you as well. And please, everyone, try to be reasonably brief so we can get through a large number of, of uh, responses. I'm sure there will be several. So first, I see Linda Alcoff. Hi, Rocio. Uh, really interesting paper. Um, I, I want to ask you about, um, you know, the issue of, of a counter temporality besides a counter memory is a, what you're really moving toward is a counter temporality. And in a way, this is just a question of clarification because, um, you know, the question is, how do you, how, how do we refashion a, a temporality? Um, I mean, we get from Glissant and others, obviously, the, the, the possibility of multiple temporalities. But do you think there's, you know, there's a danger in that that just is sort of like everything goes. And what you, you're doing is really critiquing certain temporalities. And I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, a few months ago, Arjun Arpadurai wrote this critique of Mignolo which really ticked me off. I don't know if you saw it, where he's he's accusing Mignolo of wanting to go back. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like that kind of view. So if you critique modernity, you critique the future, you critique progress, then what you're doing is you're wanting to go back. Because that's the only thing people can imagine. And so how can we intervene, you know, in in that kind of reading? And how can we how can we uh, produce an alternative temporality that will work for social movements like Neonomenos, right? Um, in which we're, um, th they, they can be um, uh, 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 assumed to, to, to have a progressivist um, temporality. So how would you, wh what would you uh, help us understand about how to do it differently? Thank you so much. It's, it's really nice to see you, Linda. Um, thank you for being here. So thanks for the question. Um, so, so I, I think that the, the, the one person that is um, very strongly suggesting a kind of an alternative temporality is Judith uh, Espinosa, who, who wants to say, um, or who argues, um, let's dream of the past. But I don't think that um, she, um, she means that she romanticizes um, some sort of um, um, past that is posited by the even the fantasies of the modern capitalist world. So, so, so I'll, I'll get there. Let me let me just say something really quickly that um, what is interesting about um, uh, this work in in, in Espinosa Minoso and in um, and in Hartman. Um, is that um, you know there for 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 Espinosa Minoso the present is the future, and it's the future because it is the realization of the modern project of progress, technology, you know, um, of advancement, um, of um, you know, uh, democracy, of pl pl pluralism. Um, it it is. Um, it is all of that, all of those epistemic coordinates that are precisely what structure, for example, projects of development that have um, kind of, you know, undermined um, to, to, to be generous, right? Um, you know, the, the, the very structure of life uh, of non-Western co contexts. Um, and so, 
So um, just the very apparatus of development, if I can get someone like Atul Skowar, you know, um, that that whole, that whole um, uh, those coordinates of sense are precisely what she's taking up as um, precisely um, the claim that, that you know, that the, the future, the imagined future, the, the, the future of notions of progress and advance is the present. It has been realized. The future of, you know, kind of ideas about, you know, classical ideas that we might have been teaching in philosophy, maybe not still, but of, you know, kind of the scientific revolution and, you know, and the enlightenment um, and all of this, you know, kind of the Western rational um, coordinates of sense that has been realized, that is the present. And it is a present of ecological degradation, of racial terror and a racial hierarchy. And of course, a very specific, and this is what interests me in this paper, um, of the ways in which those coordinates end up capturing even emancipatory projects. So you have something like, you know, feminist or um, LGBTQ or queer thought and praxis that get, you know, captured by, you know, modern Western rationality in always offering a picture of freedom from that violence of, you know, um, uh, gender violence, for example, by going towards a, a freedom towards um, um, the coordinates of modern Western rationality and its ideas about gender embodiment, family, kinship, so on and so forth. Um, I think that what Hartman, what Hartman does is a little bit different. Um, and that's what, what was interesting to me about putting them in conversation um, that's why I mentioned that I juxtapose them because I'm not arguing that they're saying the same thing. What is interesting to me is what's happening here with these contemporary thinkers that are really taking a distance with um, not just, um, you know, betting on the future, um, but through dystopian and, um, and analyses of catastrophe are reinscribing despite, you know, despite by the task at hand or reinscribing the project of modernity, the project of progress and futurity that was the, the source of ecological de degradation, so on and so forth. So um, I think that Hartman, what is saying is that, you know, that rather than the future, the present is the future, the past is the present, right? So we have not, you know, the, the, the present is structured around a, um, a for, forms of updating and replenishing and adapting modalities of um, racial violence that are essential for the production of the modern capitalist world. Um, so, so I see them as you know providing kind of a critical, very needed critical analysis of even in a time of danger, as the one that we have been navigating for quite some time, but that became very intensified um, in the past couple of years, um, even in, the, in this moment of danger, um, critical analyses uh, tend to replicate, right, um, you know, that liberal imaginary that, you know, is the, is the epistemic and the aesthetic arm of how capitalism operates and how it internal to it is a racial order, necessary for it is a racial order that also produces gender violence and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't think, you know, they're, you know, what, so the only, per, so the, the, of the authors, you know, Judith Espinosa says, well, we should dream of the past, but I don't think that she romanticizes a past in the way that Apadurai's critique of Mino, Mignolo, um, you know, I, that's what I hear that, you know, um, some sort of romanticization. Um, it is rather, you know, a uh, uh, thinking of the type of porosity, that's her word, una porosidad, like a porosity that is part of what was posited as traditional, quote unquote, backward, as that which had to be left behind in order to enter into the freedom of, you know, uh, dissident forms of sexuality um, or, or non-binary gender expression. Um, so, so, uh, even, even her who wants to say, let's dream of the past, she doesn't mean necessarily let's go 
back to some sort of, because the only going back to is from the perspective of, you know, kind of this, these ideas that are posited by the modern imaginary or traversed by it at the very least. Um, I think what she's, she's saying is that, you know, that that which was relegated to the past um, itself was, you know, full of, you know, dissident practices and, um, and their own non-normative uh, 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 practices of resistance that are, so that's why it's memory, counter memory that she's um, arguing for. Um, so, so um, yeah, I hope that this clarifies a bit. So I, I, I don't know that, I, I don't know that it, um, that my project or the project as I read these authors is one of proposing an alternative temporality, but more than to, to really track how this, this idea of futurity of progress, you know, how, how we keep creeping in, how re, we keep reinstalling precisely the normative order that is the cause of, you know, um, what, generated these forms of, you know, ecological, racial, uh, gender, um, all forms of violence and, and collapse. I don't know, does that speak to your question? Yes, yeah. Okay, are there other questions? Uh, if not, I have some, but I wanna give uh, priority to uh, anybody from the audience. Uh, Greg Slack, you're on. Unmute. Yes. Okay. I'm unmuted. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was very, uh, very stimulating. I, I don't want to sound naive. I just wonder if, is there any, do you see any sense in a potential objection to your project or your reading of these authors that, that problematizes this kind of uh, this notion of modernity that you're working with, which seems very, it's like every, everything about modernity is problematic. Is there anything we want to preserve about modernity going forward into this new zone that some of the authors are trying to point toward? I mean, Marx, for instance, thought for all its horrors, capitalism was a useful historical stage. But I, I get the sense from your talk that he's in your view, he's far too much enthralled to a kind of Hegelian philosophy of history. So that's just some food for thought. If you could just respond to that comment, I'd be very grateful. Thank you so much for your question. Um, and this is this is you know um, where he he has uh, very problematic Eurocentric things to say about colonialism, colonialism, and so on. So um, I I. Is there something about modernity that needs to be saved? So I think that that's a question that I would, um, I don't think it should be the guiding question for thinking about what modernity produces, how it operates and how it, um, and what is its productivity if I am allowed of Hegelianism. Um, so what does it, what, what does, you know, what does modernity produce? What are its effects, its roots? Um, and it is, that should, I'm arguing, and this is, you know, if, if Western thinkers are, you know, um, in, in required to be uh, cited at this point, you know, you think about Frankfurt School critical theory that, that you know, someone like Adorno or Benjamin in very, very different ways, you know, they think that, you know, a negativist critique, so thinking of, of um, precisely the form, forms of injustice or forms of, um, of harm that are produced by capitalism, that those are the guiding threads to a thinking about, you know, what to do um, and so on. So, so I, I am compelled um, I closed my book on Puerto Rico with, a, with a, a reflection on pessimism, which might seem a very bad move on the basis of the fact that I catalog in the, in the book, not only the forms of kind of 
you know, neoliberal capitalism, <laughs> colonial kind of um, destruction of uh, uh, or undermining of life in Puerto Rico for Puerto Ricans, but, um, uh, uh, you know, but also the forms of resistance of Puerto Ricans, um, which is, uh, which are varied and, and very powerful. But I, I, I close with pessimism and especially a, uh, an engagement of Walter Benjamin's uh, with uh, Pierre Naville. Um, and it's a, actually an engagement of Rafael Bernabe, who's an economist in Puerto Rico, who's engaging Benjamin, who's engaging Naville. And, you know, Benjamin is saying something like, you know, utopia, progressivism, these are like, these are bourgeois, this is a bourgeois imaginary that will only reinstall kind of, it, you know, he doesn't put it this way, but only reinstall, um, uh, well, well, he talks about the, the image space. So it only reinstalls this, um, uh, this the epistemic and the aesthetic coordinates of the ca capitalist modern world, which he is criticizing. Um, and so he says, let it, you know, he bets on, or, you know, orienting ourselves you know, um, uh, by pessimist. Um, and he doesn't mean like not doing anything and just like, you know, giving up and like everything is bad. And so we should just, you know, call it a day, but rather something like, it is from the detritus of the catastrophe that we are oriented as to what to do rather than a let us, let us try to figure out or posit a normative universe that replicates the gesture of those very things that are producing um, the downturn itself. Um, so, so, so I, I think that you know we can answer the question as to whether something could be saved about modernity or multiple modernities um, if we have figured out how to wade through, you know, its own productivity such that. Um, uh, so that we can not replicate the forms of radical undermining and violence that it seems to produce consistently. Okay, <clears throat> I'm tempted to jump in along the same lines, but I'll wait and give the floor to Patricia, who has a question. Great, thank you. Actually, the answer that you just gave is starting to help illuminate the question that I have, which is around, it's an open-ended question around prefigurative politics. So I think that, yeah, one of the ways of thinking about a mode of political practice, like solidarity, for example, is as a way of prefiguring the kind of world that we want to live in. And it can be thought of in a really non-ideal, and I think is practiced actually, in a really non-ideal way, um, similar to what you just described, you know, out of the sort of like rubble and violence that we live in, um, how are we relating to each other in ways in which we'd like to see expanded and developed in all of this. Um, but there is, and so I think it's like a very emancipatory mode um, to think prefiguratively, but I think what you just presented poses a challenge to projects like that one. Um, and I think it at least presents a challenge of being wary of reinscribing, I think was your word, um, these, um, the logics of modernity um, that we're caught up in. So I just wonder if you have any reflections on prefiguration um, as maybe practicing counter memory, although I guess prefiguration references the, the future rather than the past. Um, so I'm getting a little bit confused with all the times, um, but yeah, wondering what you think. Yeah, thank you so much. That's such a great question. And I think that you know, I do, I mentioned it in the book on Puerto, um, Puerto Rico and in colonial debts. I, I do, I, I don't discuss it extensively, but I do mention, especially when I discuss Jerry Marbonilla's work um, and her, even her field notes about, you know, the summer 19, 2019 protest in Puerto Rico that, um, you know, um, ousted uh, Governor Ricky Rosselló and um, the, 
asambleas de pueblo, the um, town assemblies that were, you know, actually coextensive, um, but also became very like robust after his resignation. Um, and I think that um, the, you know, she, it, she she kind of mentions like this is kind of a form of prefigurative politics because there are kind of new political constituencies being formed um and you know rather than a kind of having this like normative exercise of ideal theoretic normative exercise is really from the meeting and um kind of um you know listing the needs of communities the harms done to communities and the possibilities um, that you know this new form of life and forms of solidarity, you know, could emerge. And in fact, you know, I, I don't even think arguably. I think it's 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 clear that the type of organization, political organization that we saw in 2019 in Puerto Rico, was due to the type of solidarity. Um, um, and you know, just like organic, um, um, kind of uh, kind of spontaneous organization that was necessary in the context of Hurricane Maria, um, and that already were part of you know establishing infrastructure through like the, the, right right now the huge energy crisis that has been very long in the in, you know in the formation, and and water crisis and. Um, um, that required infrastructure, social and actual infrastructures of, you know, waterways and so relating to water, relating to energy, um, that, um, you know, gave the, you know, fed and made possible this political imagination, but also the forms of, um, the forms of solidarity um, that are usually seen as having been undermined completely by austerity and so on and so forth. Um, so, so I really, I, I love your comment because I think it's, it's right on, um, that it's in the practice and forms of praxis that, you know, that, that generate ideas about how to live um, and how to do so autonomous from the state and capital um, which are colonial apparatuses in the case of Puerto Rico. Um, and so, so yeah, and the temporality bit of it, I think this is where I would say the these notions get like content. Um, um, I think that they they get content in very different spaces, you know, so Julia Kepinosa was, Thinking about Miriam Bixum and um, thinking about you know you know indigenous communities you know fighting me mega mining projects, you know in Puerto Rico um, um, you know these these forms of autonomous infrastructure and solidarity, community kitchens, a lot longstanding mutual aid projects, they they build and they they build on forms of relationality and solidarity that are precisely undermined by the neoliberal imaginary of the, this colonial neoliberal state um, and its relationship obviously to the US. So, um, so I think that the temporality thing shouldn't kind of stomp us. It should be that it's not a past as if it were some state that is not traversed by modernity, but it's again like within our very spaces that are constructed by this capitalist modern Older, there's many autonomous forms of relationality, uh, autonomous from it that exist and have existed and have persisted, and those are sites of, you know, um, living otherwise. Might one might say. Okay, I want to jump in, um, and then after that will be Pedro. I have uh, two related questions, sort of following up on some of the earlier ones. <clears throat> At one point, you talked about a non-normative appeal to memory. And I'm wondering, uh, just to turn this a putatively non-normative appeal to memory, sort of to turn your own critique against that kind of claim, um, how can you be sure that it is, I don't really entirely understand what non-normative means in that context. How can you be sure that the appeal to memory is in fact non-normative? I mean, memories are quite selective by their very nature. 
And I'm just a little bit wary of the uh, notion that one can actually avoid the normative because it's uh, so rooted in so much of life. So, I mean, uh, wouldn't it appeal to some conception of freedom, for example, but of course not necessarily an enlightenment one, a very different one. And you talked about domination and injustice in that connection, and those are clearly normative in some way. So I wanted a clarification about that. And also along that line too, not all relational, I mean, the, uh, we need to be more relational for sure. And I think there's a lot of value um, I mean, entirely in these alternative forms that, um, that, that center relationality. But not all of it is wholesome and non-dominating. Not all forms of relationality are, are non-dominating. So what is the role for critique of forms of relationality that are to be appropriated or uh, you know, brought to the fore? And uh, what do those appeal to in terms of anything potentially normative? Okay, so thank you so much for these questions. Um, so, so I, um, and I really apologize because probably I was reading very fast, but um, so I don't, I don't use the term non-normative appeal to memory, but rather non-normative memory um, or a memory of non-normative, within the normative order of capitalist modern life. Which is to say that, um, that, um, that memory is a recovery of those practices and, and those forms of relation and relationality that have al always existed, that are not structured by um, you know, ideas about private property, you know, heter heteronormative, cis heteronormative order and kind of the, you know, nuclear family, so on and so on and so forth. Um, so, so what I think that, and this leads to the second question, that, for example, Espinosa Miñoso um, is, is really very brilliantly um, noting is that, um, you know, that that, that, that distinction between the normative order that always signifies these particular um, way of organizing subjectivity, authority, um, quote unquote nature, pr production and productivity, so on, um, that, 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 you know, that normative order is, um, you know, it's structured structured around those um, those specific commitments um, that um, um, you know become reified as if their totalizing nature were successful in completely evacuating of any resistance to this particular way of life. Um, so. So when she talks about porosity, she's talking about the fact that um, other forms of kinship, of gender dissidence or like sexual dissidence, um, um, you know, uh, other forms of organizing relationality have uh, that that are in resistance to the forms, you know, of the normative order of major capitalist modernity have have always existed. So memory is a recovery of something that remains. Um, 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 so it's, um, so in a way, memory is an interesting selection of, of hers, um, because it's not something, and this came out in the manifesto very well, of, um, uh, that, um, you know, it, it is a memory of the fact that these, these forms of life continue to exist. Um, so... Of course, there is, um, you know, this is not to romanticize these spaces or these forms of relationality. So she's, she's not saying that, you know, um, all gender or all sexual dissident or queer subjects, um, you know, find in their kinship structures, you know, wel welcoming, you know, so, you know, so on and so forth spaces. But what she is saying is that that, distinction between 
um, freedom as being accorded by a form of life that permits or that structures or has codified legally or, you know, in terms of just uh, um, uh, uh, kind of a, the, the general kind of co common sense um, that has formalized and codified uh, queer or sexual dissidents, that, that that is reified by positing other spaces as not allowing something like sexual dissidence or something like non-binary uh, non gender, gender expression and so on and so forth. And so when, when feminist reason, you know, aims to, to free women, right, <laughs> of, uh, or, or to make spaces for, you know, um, um, you know uh, the eradication of gender violence or, um, you know, the, 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 the support and, um, um, uh, of uh, uh, sexual dissidence, uh, they end up reinscribing a racial norm um, in the sense of reinscribing the, the modern capitalist project that is based yeah. that relegates to the past, relegates to tradition, so on and so forth. These other um, these other forms of relationality, those are porous, she says. So they're not pure. So the idea that that nor you know like. Um, dominating or non-dominating that those those normative distinctions in critical theory or in uh, or a critique of um you know gender um um you know or, or feminist critique of of these spaces they become reified because of precisely this idea of futurity and pastness so that is her argument, and I think that, that that actually goes quite a bit long way because it provides flexibility. Not that I don't want to say flexibility; it provides the possibility of um, other forms of relationality um, that are not necessarily measured, you know, um, in terms of domination or non-domination in right. Western key. Could I just, I just one follow up. I mean, the critique, uh, we, I think most of us here would agree with completely, but I'm just wondering about whether the, any author putting themselves in that place is being sufficiently self-critical about the degree to which their own perspective itself may involve um, norms and ne not necessarily um, enhancing ones or constructive ones. And how, how is that kind of self-criticism and the critique of ideology to be uh, applied to the person who is attempting to retrieve these memories? How, how, is there any, obviously you can't give a guarantee uh, that it's going to be, you know, or is it just a process of stepping outside, but then is it sort of like, does it go all the way to Heideggerian letting being be and whatever, or it, it can't. So, so uh, I don't understand, I understand you keep reverting to the criticism with which I, we all agree, but in terms of the, what is added by the, um, by the memory element, um, just to our, I, what kind of um, process would at least help to, assure that it isn't going to be itself ideological. Right. Um, so there is no Heidegger anywhere. <laughs> Good. I just wanted to make sure of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the later Heidegger anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, you know, The claim about whether this ends up in some other ideological formation. So what it, it is a it is a an account of in in, in Espinosa Minosa, since we're talking about her work more than um, uh, more specifically here, because she's the one that claims um, has a claim about porosity um, and about pastness right, or recovering the past or in the non-normative memory. Um, so, you know, for her, um, it is part of precisely a critique that um, provides for her in particular a genealogy of feminist reason, 
in particular modern Eurocentric feminist reason that has constructed the category of woman in a in a in a key based on a, uh, that that has as its basis um, um, it's it's not an intersectional account it has as its basis a racial order so the the, the very category of woman and th this matters for example for political projects, for questions of public policy, for, for, for philosophical projects of critique, where by you know, emancipatory projects reinscribe, right? Um, uh, kind of a, a, a specific uh, racial order through a project of, um, you know, by leaving intact the very category of woman and how it operates. And this is, of course, has been a, a very long-standing and important, you know, criticism that has been launched um, by Black feminists um, uh, and, and, and women working in the Black critical tradition and in decolonial feminists, mostly in, in the Caribbean and, and Latin America, um, not necessarily in, in the, in, based in the U.S. Um, so, so it is a it is a genealogy of the formation and the operation of the category of woman that reinscribes the racial norm in all of these projects, not just in an imperialist type of key or a form of kind of epistemic imperialism, but rather as a as a as as a way of capturing emancipatory projects themselves. So. So she she is quite self reflective, um, uh, insofar as she has, and she this is a long standing, decades long project of actually building a genealogy of feminist reason in Latin America that tries to provide precisely um, a, a historical critical account in the Foucauldian sense, in a, a in a way um, of of the production and the operation of the category of woman. Um, so, so I think that far from ideological, she's actually closer to a more classical philosophical exercise in that way. Um, but, um, but she's in her positive moment, what she's positing is that everything that has been relegated to the past or the non-normative or to spheres of domination have a porosity to them where there are forms of resistance that are guiding our critical projects or that could be guiding our critical projects rather than this reinstallation of the racial order of capitalist modernity through emancipatory projects that end up like writing public policy on gender uh, in, in many places or that end up like being the epistemic apparatus of NGOs all over Latin America, so on and so forth. Okay, great, let me call on Pedro. Hola, Rocio. Thank you so much for your talk. Wonderful. Um, my question was also open-ended, um, like Patricia's, um, about solidarity. And I guess my question is, how do you see your project, or you know, maybe more broadly, like decolonial feminisms, serving as a hinge between movements that are more sort of ecological, say, in defense of territory, or you know, like eco-territorial movements? and um, say the city, for example. I think, um, you know, this critique of gender, race, sexuality can be a really powerful hinge. And you were talking about that, like between the countryside and the city, like it can sort of dismantle these traditional oppositions between city and countryside or like people who benefit from extractivism and people who are beneficiary, um, people who suffer the most from extractivism. So where do you see these critiques of gender and sexuality and race? serving as, as a common platform that can bring together these different movements? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that there's just a lot of, of you know, coalitions that are very also, you know, they are to be problematized and kind of thought through. But in, in Latin America, in North America, in the Caribbean of, um, you know, um, indigenous and black feminists and fe feminism um, and their allies that are really trying to think through precisely and act, you know, and, and, and um, a, a, quite a bit of activists, um, perhaps you, you know of that, 
that bring from their own context, not a universalized right perspective, but rather, um, you know, uh, tr trying to understand how, you know, how how the the, the problems that um, um, that their communities have to navigate and the ways that they resist and theorizing from those locations. Um, and I think that, you know, um, you know, I think that there's just a, a wonderful, important set of um, not just conceptual innovations um, or perhaps not in innovations, but, you know, concepts that, you know, and uh, uh, I wouldn't want to say theories, but theorizing. Um, um, fr from a specific context, um, if you think of Terricidio in the southern, you know, uh, in Argentina and Chile with the Mapuche um, uh, communities, if you think about the notion of cuerpo territorio and um, throughout um, Latin America, um, um, if you think about, um, you know, a lot of decolonial feminists in the Caribbean um, who are Black feminists who are thinking about, again, um, uh, you know, how does racism operate um, and anti-Black violence operate in the context of the Caribbean um, in, with its particularities. And they are all speaking to each other and organizing with each other without having to collapse, um, you know, and form solidarities around it. If you're, you might be interested in um, um, you know, the, the website of Glefas, um, um, I forget what it stands for now, but I'll look it up and put it on the on the chat. Um, but yeah, and you know, a lot of important theorizing also in in you know indigenous and and black studies in the U.S. Um, you know, Tiffany Lethabo King's work, um, the Black Shoals. Of, so 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 I think that these are um, there is a lot of praxis and theory that has been produced and act and sanaccionado that has, you know, um, that is there for, to, to have different critical tools, but also um, different coordinates of sense to orient ourselves and to think about the relationship between ecological, uh, you know, economic, racial, gender, um, violence and the like. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Um, can I ask a quick, quick follow up? Carl? Yeah, very quick though. Yeah, yeah very quick. Um, do you think there's any sense in trying to figure out the basis for the solidarity? For example, you know, you could analyze um, colonial race and gender as functional to extractivism or capitalism, and that's one way of like framing what brings people together. You can think of our notions like buen vivir or you know forms of relationality and communality that were suppressed and are now giving new visions that transform not only like, say like gender relations between say men and women, but more diversity of genders and things like that. So um, I don't know, I'm just wondering what you think about like the philosophical work of um, figuring out what forms the basis for the solidarities and especially when there's so much diversity of coalitions, as you said. Yeah, and I think that that, um, you know, also kind of the basis of solidarity and not necessarily, you know, on forms of incommensurability. Um, those, I think, are the most productive ways of, of kind of entering into um, forms of solidarity. Um, and, um, you know, I, I take, I tend to think that, um, um, that, you know, there are, for example, in decolonial feminism, there are quite a bit of um, debates about, you know, patriarchy and the role of patriarchy. But of course, you know, if you if you think about the ra uh, the racial order of capitalist modernity and provide an account of its emergence and its operation and its adaptations, you know, then the notion of patriarchy is quite troubled um, in terms of who who is the patriarch, you know you know, the type of kind of universalizing, like flattening of positions that doesn't actually, that then reproduces a lot of problems for cer certain feminist theorizing and, um, and certain feminist um, organizing. So, so I do think that, you know, that, that the question of, 
the emergence and the continuation and the adaptation of forms of racial violence, um, not just of forms of racial order. And, you know, um, is, is important for thinking about how capitalism operates and its updates, um, how gender operates and, you know, is, is again, so on and so forth. So, um, and then, you know, that route, you know, importantly, you know, pushes us to consider what does solidarity look like within a range of incommensurable experiences. For me, that's the most productive route. Well, on that provocative note, uh, please join me in thanking Rocio for a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you all for um, joining us today.